Hey, this is Ben Gray from Deer Boy. You are listening to the New Wave Music Podcast. Today, T-Bone and myself have a fantastic guest joining us on the New Wave Music Podcast. We have Julian Shaw Taylor with us today. Our listeners may know Julian from the band Strange Love, the Depeche Mode Experience. In addition to Strange Love, Julian also performs as the Electric Duke, which is a great David Bowie uh, tribute. Julian, thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule to join us on the New Wave Music Podcast. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so much for having me. So, uh, Julian, as we mentioned, you're part of the band Strange Love, the Depeche Mode Experience. It seems like you're touring nonstop with Strange Love. We Um, are. We've been we've been working very hard. I mean, the pandemic had us down. I mean, we didn't we didn't tour at all. We didn't do anything. We did two two live streams where we recorded, you know, our our parts at home acoustically and then, you know, broadcast those. But I, I was, you know, digging in to try and get them get them to do more, but it's quite hard because we all live in different states. Uh so we got the singer Leo who lives up in um New York. Um, uh, in Brooklyn then we've got the other singer main singer Martin Gore guy lives in uh, Texas and then there's myself and James living in California but quite far apart so there's just no way we could do anything and so that that's for a while has been my you know my principal source of income as a touring <laughs> musician it's it's you know the only way to make money with music now is touring really mm-hmm. and then you know, wasn't happening. So <laughs> now we're, we're making up for lost time. We're off to Australia in November. Oh, good. Oh. Uh, although, as I say, Cabo yesterday and just, oh. just one show in Los Cabos and fly, drive to San Diego, cross the border to Tijuana, fly to Los Cabos, fly back within 24 hours and drive back up to Pasadena, which is where I live now, South Pasadena. Oh, my. Wow. Yes. <laughs> well, in addition to being to touring with Strange Love, it seems like you've been busy releasing a bunch of mu- new music this year. Um, if we can just talk about the collaboration you did with Arden and the Wolves at the end of time. As a Bowie fan and a, and a Labyrinth fan, I found this song to be me- nothing short than mesmerizing. And Was this something that you came up with or just asked to contribute to the album? So Arden, um, Arden approached me to do a duet with her and I did a track and put together, a, a, you know, I'd, I'd actually, I think I'd pretty much, the track was one of the ones I have in the, in the um, pipeline, so to speak. I mean, I, I, I work every day on music mm-hmm. and I produce different tracks with different sort of intentions whether they're going to end up as my music or they're going to go to somebody else. That's always in debate. I don't know. So I think I had a track that sounded a little bit like the midnight. Do you know the band, the midnight? Yes. Uh Right. So I, I think I'd heard one of the midnight songs. I was very inspired by it. I thought it was great sonically. So I tried to sort of like do something a bit similar. Arden approached me to do a duet. So I said, okay, fine. Sent her that track. She was very into it. And surprisingly, because my context is normally I really work hard with songwriters to develop what they do. But Arden came in with lyrics and song done. She was, I mean, I, we worked a little bit on on the lyrics to, to tighten them up, a little bit on the melodies to get something out of it. But she was really good. I was very pleased with what she brought in. So let's talk about you a little bit. Um, can you give us kind of a brief history of your career, such as, you know, how old you were when you started singing and performing and, and like I say, just kind of an overall view of your career? I was five when I started singing in front of, you know, the, the school and my grandmother was a, a piano. Well, she was a music teacher and she was she'd been in business for a while, but she was always a teacher in her heart. So she taught me singing, piano. She had me playing the trumpet. And then I got a choral scholarship to Durham Cathedral Choir School, which is a cathedral up in the north of England. 
where I became the um, principal soloist for the choir. That was, and I learned church organ, violin, viola, clarinet, piano, voice, music theory, all that sort of stuff. So I was classically trained for about 10 years. I then went to boarding school again in a different place. Um, Durham Cathedral Choir School, as a sidebar, was is the basis for Hogwarts. So I went to Hogwarts school. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the magic they taught me was simply musical. And so, Julian, I've, I've read a comment that, said, that kind of described you as Bowie, Prince, and Robert Smith all rolled up into one. Clearly, I can tell that you've been heavily influenced by David Bowie. Were there any other artists that you've been influenced by or that's helped shape your career? I mean, honestly, Prince was the first, my first exposure to music that wasn't, well, my, my stepfather um, played me the Beatles. I loved the Beatles when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. The Monkees and the Beatles, those are my two <laughs> twin poles. And a, and a band called Status Quo. I don't know if you've ever oh. heard of those guys. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and I would not admit to that, except in public in a podcast, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Status Quo were, were, were great. And the Beatles were just, I mean, there's no nobody can touch the Beatles because, you know, everything they did to me, experimentation, they went out there, they really changed the face of music. And um, so then Prince just appeared I don't know how I, I think I heard 1999 and then uh, Paisley Park on the radio. And I was just floored because it, it is absolutely the diametric opposite of Benjamin Britten. <laughs> <laughs> we were singing a lot of Benjamin Britten stuff, which is neo, I guess it's neo medievalism, you, you hmm. could call it. And I, I was the soloist, so I was singing all this kind of stark but sumptuous cathedral music. And then Prince comes along, and, and I think the first song that really blew my mind was If I Was Your Girlfriend, because mm. there is no structural thing that you can hold on to as a musician. It is a completely alien form of music to, to a classically trained music, musician, because it's just a bass line and stacked voices that aren't choir voices. They're sort of, I can't describe it. It, it was so... <laughs> so revelatory to me so i just fell in love with this weird guy and you know he's on the cover of his album sort of i mean i well love when love sexy comes out he's just naked on the cover of his album <laughs> like, i mean there's something very homoerotic about it but that wasn't what i was picking up it's just there's freedom mm. that i was picking up from him and and the funk just suddenly like i don't know have you ever seen the wrath of khan Yep. Oh yeah, where, oh, where yeah. the guy gets the 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 worm put in his ear, uh, it yeah. sort of nestles in his brain. That was Prince. That was Prince for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no question that he was, you know, a huge influence on so many artists of his of that time. So yeah, it doesn't surprise me. Oh, he's was magnificent, just completely alien to went to anything I'd ever heard before, and, and, right. and he was. And I went to see him. He's one of my first concerts. My my mm. stepfather took me, mm -hmm. and. I, it ruined music for me for the rest of my life. Can you imagine <laughs> the Love Sexy tour? And that's the first concert you ever go to. And there's a bed <laughs> and a hoop and a, and a car circling the stage. Like he, he literally had the car from Alphabet Street on stage with him. And I'm like, this is what concerts are going to be like. And then, of yeah. course, nobody except maybe Lady Gaga ever has <laughs> equipment, you know, so... <laughs> Yeah, he set a bar a little too high. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when he when he died, when Bowie and Prince and Leonard Cohen and Muhammad mm. Ali and George mm. Michael died in the same year, that was my youth. So, Julian, you used to go by the the name, or or you used to have the band called The Singularity, and the new album that you released is released just under your your name. Are you moving away from The Singularity, or you you uh, just kind of going solo, or dropping that band name? Um, it was never a band. We, we had a live band, but all the recordings of The Singularity, if you listen to the pr previous two albums under the name The Singularity, that was just me on my own. There's a couple of songs where I brought the guys from the live band in. My manager, I, I was managed for a brief moment by Vicky Hamilton, who used to manage Guns N' Roses. She saw, she, she Googled The Singularity as a band name and found that there were probably about six or seven The Singularities out there so she just said look go under your own name it's all you anyway unless i get collaborators in so i just thought okay fine fair enough 
You have remixed Beauty and Chaos. Uh, that's from Wayne Hussey of the Mission UK. He was in Sisters of Mercy and Dead or Alive of all pe- of all groups. Uh, how was it working with such a legend? So I, I didn't meet Wayne, and I'm you know I I hope at some point because I th- I know that the Mission are touring currently, and I would love mm-hmm. to meet him because I, I also worked with his wife Cynthia on a couple of remixes. I did I did a when I did the the Wayne remix, I mean, I picked from a selection of songs that were already, already existed um, of Beauty and Chaos. And of course, you know, when I saw Wayne's name there, I was just like, okay, it's got to be Wayne Hussey. Because when, after, after my, you know, Prince obsession, the next obsession I had was The Cure. And of course, The Cure gave rise to Sisters of Mercy and The Mission and Bauhaus and all those guys. Which, so I was kind of like funk on one side and goth on the other. <laughs> so they, you know, that's in some ways like, you know, because on the on the new album, I've worked with Robert Margaleff and he did Stevie Wonder and Devo. Yeah. So it's almost like yeah. he's the perfect producer to work with for me because, you know, it's it's rock and funk. I mean, it's, yeah. it's art, rock and funk, you know. And so, right. You know, he brought a little bit more of that print side out of me when we worked together because I could play you the demo of End of the Line and it's a electro goth track. Oh, wow. And he just made me put funk bass and and funk guitar on it and change the beat and that was a, that was the perfect collaboration because you know he he put that he put that idea in my head that i should lean into that funky thing didn't oh, yeah. completely forgot forget what the question was i think so. <laughs> i was just you know uh, uh working with somebody who's so legendary as wayne hussey oh no yeah absolutely i mean i, I i've got a, a very very kind voicemail from him saying how much he liked the remix but I've never met him, and I, and I've, oh, I would gotcha. be thrilled to because he, he, Children was one of my favorite albums. Oh, favorite. great very, album! Absolutely very wonderful album. You know, yes. So Steve already alluded to it, but let's talk about your new album that you just released called Elysium. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have some great contributions from MG, uh, MGT, Chris Olivas from Berlin, and then of course another legend, David J of Love and Rockets and Bauhaus. Mm-hmm. How was it working with David J on the track The Devil Knows? I work with David quite a bit. He's one of the my he's in fact he's one of the collaborators I've worked with most in my life. I, I do a lot of remix stuff with him. He gets a remix in, and when my studio is free, he'll just come in, and we'll we'll do that together. I've he, I've also produced the first side of his new album that's coming out. Oh. So oh. Uh, yeah, we work together a lot, and basically the exchange is that he comes and plays on some of my stuff. So he's played on a fair n- number of songs. Oh, nice. This album was put together. It is a concept album in some ways, so it's the only song that he played on that fits into this album but there will be others coming. Oh, great. Great. And, you know, you kind of mentioned it earlier about really being a multi-instrumentalist on Elysium. Are you doing most of the instruments or do you have a band that you bring in? No, it's, it's aside from the collaborators listed, it's all me. So I played the drums, programmed the drums, um, played the synths, played all the pianos, all the, because I'm, I'm principally a guitar player and a piano player. But I also have an array of synths that I, I, I use too. And I experiment. I mean, I'll use, I'll sample something and I'll, I'll do the kind of Depeche Mode thing where I'll sample it and then make that into <laughs> the instrument. And I mean, I like playing with pedals, you know, guitar pedals and things like that. I like experimenting with sound a lot. Oh, yeah. You can tell although, that on the album. Although this album, funnily enough, is, is probably one of the least experimental um, <laughs> albums sonically that I've made. Um, because I wanted it to be direct. The theme of the album is is my uh, is it, that it has a purity to it. Like I oh. fell in love, and it, it it was released on the anniversary of of that first meeting at the cl- sorry it wasn't the anniversary of the first meeting. I first met her at Elysium, the club in Austin, oh. and because of the name and the way the connotations that that has. I just thought this is a good, you know, this is a bookend. And then we, the first time we 
clashed in matter, quoting my own lyric from my last album, <laughs> was was October the 18th. So it was released on that day and it seemed, seemed to be appropriate. Great album. Um, of course, there's the, the track, The End of the Line is a great song. It's the end of the line. Other tracks that stood out to me uh, were The Devil Knows that we just discussed, Melt. You melt into my arms as the night grows colder. We're melting under stars tonight. Oh, you melt into my arms. Evolution. I love the track Lupin. I've got a wolf inside of me. He's been sleeping so long, but you have set him free from a cage that wasn't locked in the first place. From the shadows of society's empty spaces. But Secret is the album highlight for T-Bone and myself. It has everything that makes a great song. Engaging lyrics, the right vocals, strong instrumentation. I've got this. Uh, did this one stand out to you when you were writing and recording it? It's it's the it's the oldest song in the set. It's one of the first songs I wrote when I moved to London. It, it's actually it's appropriate that I recorded it when I did. I always felt it was a bit poppier than I would normally go towards. To be honest, it's a, it's a, pop, it's a pop song for a record which is generally filled with sort of art, art rock, and it did stand out in that sense. Rock Margalef chose it from a, a selection of demos that I had with because I worked with Robert for over a period of about six months in 2018 I think 2017 2018 and he selected the songs he wanted to to work on and I just thought okay so if I'm ever going to get a good version of this song so I've recorded it before and it's not that different honestly it's just he went really cohesive on the on the you know, it's it's one guitar, it's one bass line, it's it's horns. So it's very simple compared to a lot of the stuff that I normally work on. And and I appreciate him for that because I would have drowned it in sounds and made it weirder <laughs> and all that stuff. But it is definitely, you know, a more straightforward single, isn't it? Yeah, you know, a pop song or not, uh, it, it is stuck in my brain. <laughs> and that's what I think I like so much about it is it, it's just, it's a hummable song. It, it sticks with you. Thoroughly enjoyable. I, I, I think it's one of the best on the album. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, also, All Good Soldiers is a fantastic track on this album, and it really has kind of a Bowie vibe to it. All good soldiers know the shadows they are lighting to win the war the sacrifice they are making I believe our love will win in the end Was that planned or did it just kind of come together that way? Weirdly, I was very much inspired by another artist for that song. I won't mention who it is because I don't want it to be associated. <laughs> but um, I mean, thank you. I mean, I can't, I can't avoid Bowie reference in, in my material just because he's so part of my DNA, especially, you know, being in a Bowie tribute. I actually, I have a proper Bowie tribute with, with a six piece band as well that, um, that plays around LA and we do big shows, but not, we, because Strange Love is so busy, that one doesn't play so much outside of LA. But um, All Good Soldiers is an anomaly on the album because I wrote it much more from the concept and then wanted to grow it. I wanted to make like a Bohemian Rhapsody kind of segmented song. And I wanted to have a guitar moment because I love playing guitar and nobody, 
a, one of the perils of being in tribute is that people associate me with keyboards and as being the keyboard player, not the vocalist. Mm. So August Soldiers has no keyboards on it at all. It's completely a guitar song. And I, it was very important to me to have at least one on the record, which was a guitar freak out moment. For me, it's the most fun song to play. That one and Darkling You, which is the last song on the album, those two, mm-hmm. when I play them live and I'm playing guitar, it's, it gives me the most thrill. Because mm. because they they have that energy and that sort of like spiky aggression in some ways, you know. Elysium is a great album. Is there any tracks that stood out to you, or is there any tracks that you would recommend our listeners to check out, uh, whether it be on this album or or just any songs in your library? I mean, you know, my big my biggest song is 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 a song called Wetter. Is, uh, yeah. which is a, a which has been a hit in the past from the from this album. I mean, if it's secret for you guys, then I'm I'm happy for you to put that one. I, I really don't, you know. I, I as I say, w- whichever one makes more people experience and enjoy the whole record as a whole. Because the problem nowadays is people, you know, seem to playlist rather than listen to albums in their entirety. But I, I'm very proud of the flow of it and the song selection in in its entirety. So. If if it's secret for you, then sure, let's go with that one. Well, I completely agree with you. I mean, this album as a whole entirely works. Um, you know, yeah, we we Steve and I might have a favorite song here or there, but I think you're absolutely right. From beginning to end, uh, every song is worth worth listening to. It's really an album that uh, should not be bought as singles. It should be listened to to its entirety. Thank you. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I have. I put. I had a short list. Um, I like. I like to engage the fans or you know singular people as I call them. And um, I asked. I sent to a, a, a select few of them. I sent a, a, an expanded track listing. So I had about twenty five songs recorded for this record, and I sent seventeen out to try and get everybody's opinion. And it was useless because everybody had a different opinion. There was no. Yeah. But, but they were coherent. Tra- tracks in between them and well, there's a song on the record called Bet Your Life You can bet your life when you are so bad you make me feel so right I feel so good you make it so right which I recorded with um, David Jay's acoustic and, and bass but I played them <laughs> <laughs> left them at my studio you know, to his, the fool. And um, I thought that was a, a song that would probably not make the record. And I love it personally. I mean, it means a lot to me, like the lyrically, because it fits the context so very well, I wanted to include, to include the song. But so many people listed that as one of their top five. So mm. it's strange. I, you know, I never know. I mean, when I write a song, it's like I can get very attached to a song. And like All Good Soldiers, for example, I thought, this is great. I love this song. It's one of my favorite I've ever written, but nobody else will recognize yeah. that. But it is coming out as a very popular song, too. Cool. And of course, Secret, when I was recording it, I was like, this is going to be this. That was my grandmother's favorite song that I ever wrote. <laughs> I mean, she maybe she's, you know, the greatest A&R that never was. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you just mentioned Darkling You just a moment ago, and that song to me has a little bit more of an industrial sound musically. The universe is open wide for you and me if we can read the signs, my Darkling Delight. Was something a little darker a challenge, or is that just something part of your repertoire? You, if you d- delve back into my catalogue, I mean, the album Emptiness Inside, which is the prior one, it's a long time ago. I didn't didn't do any promo for it. I didn't release any singles off it. But that is a very dark record. Mm. I just needed to clear the decks to make way for a new context. So I'm, I'm a lot darker usually with my material. Mm. It, 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 this album is, is a happy album about meeting the love of my life. So I, most of the songs... 
are a little happier. I mean, the first two songs are about the end of the last relationship, and then the rest <laughs> of it is developing the new one. Darkling You is a contemplation song. It's actually my beloved asked me to record a song that she could work out to. So that's yeah. actually where it's from. <laughs> it's got the energy of a workout. Yeah, it does. So Julian, you're, you were most recently nominated for a Grammy for your work on At the End of the Line, the Chatfield remix. It's the end of the line, yeah. And we're sliding, sliding away. I watch you slide and slide and What was your reaction when you found out about that? I mean, I'm I'm a unsigned artist, originally from England, you know, sort of set adrift in the world of, you know, country music and, and Motley Crue. I mean, I live in LA, <laughs> so, you know, that is the context. There are no artists like me around. So to have somebody feel that I'm worthy of going for one of those sort of like international considerations is 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 mind-boggling i mm. i am just incredibly honored to have been nominated i mean i i love the song i think it's great and mm-hmm. it was david chatfield took it to a, a a place of you know it's it he really dug into what what the song is as a pop song see to me it's the the the, the context of the song it starts off a certain way and then it evolves and evolves and evolves and goes into this like huge guitar solo moment and he trimmed it trimmed all that fat off and just made it a pop song which great if that communicates I, all i want to do with my music is communicate with people and i want to touch people i want them to have an emotional reaction i want them to be invested and that's all i want i just want to communicate and so if he can do that and use that and then it, if if the grammy nomination gets it to more ears and more people are in you know infused by it then i'm thrilled with it all the better. Yeah. <laughs> so, Julian, one of the things that I thought about after listening to this album is that if radio took any chances, numerous songs on this album would be huge hits. Is it frustrating that music like yours just doesn't get played on the radio? I had a really interesting conversation. A friend of mine is a guy called Eddie Temple Morris, and he is just a wonderful, wonderful guy. He's an Ira- Iranian welsh man so there's a bit of a connection there i'm from wales originally in in the west west of england little little addendum to england and he told me something he was like i sent him wetter was the song at the time it was a big a big hit here was number 12 in in the radio charts whatever and i sent it to him and and i sent him some of my other music he said julian i can see that you're great at what you do but you have to decide are you sonic youth or are you cold play Because he he gave me some insight. He was like, he plays arty music that is you know difficult to listen to, like Starcrawler or Nick Cave or or anything like that, mm-hmm. uh, which tends to not be pop structured and tends to not be a pop song. But he has friends who also play pop songs. But my music falls in the middle. Mm. It's kind of the the arrangements tend to be, as you say, like Darkening You is almost an industrial song, but it's a pop song with industrial dressing right or something like end of the line is is a pop song with weird arty context and yeah there's very little um, opportunity for me on radio context even in england or in america because yeah. even though people that listen to it will love it mm-hmm. i haven't had a hit of uh, such depth that i'm allowed to release songs that are, don't fit those paradigms like the cure can release a song that doesn't fit anywhere because it's the cure it it will be played and they can shift the dial they can make culture at this point and it did it took them a long time to get there whereas you know for somebody like me i haven't had the basis of hits to for people to just go the new julian shaw taylor i'm playing that because it's great because it doesn't fit alongside the new yeah 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 single or the the new Coldplay single or whatever so it is incredibly frustrating. Yeah. I mean, I've dealt with it all of my musical career because the people who discover it are huge fans. And right. so they exist out there. And, and you know, like I, when I reach people, but I have to reach people one by one 
Personally. Well, you know, that's why we do this podcast. I mean, the main reason is we want to um, introduce people to new music from those 80s new wave artists. But then we also have our, a different segment that we're doing right now with you on new music that has kind of that 80s sound to it. And we know that our audience would appreciate it. And we want to help get that word out. I really, really appreciate that. That's why I'm taking a lot of time currently to do things like this, where it's like, I because I know the amount of effort and I know the amount of commitment and heart that goes into doing something like this. So I really appreciate you guys. It's like I went, I played a show with um, Clive Rentery, Rentery of Farrington. Um, mm. Do you know him? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh -huh. Rome. Yep. And I'd never heard The Promise before. I'm from England. We didn't, that wasn't a song in England when, or maybe it was, but I was at school, so I couldn't listen, <laughs> couldn't listen to any pop music. And I went to the show and he was playing new, new material, new When in Rome material. And I didn't even notice The Promise because hmm. the new material was so strong and excellent. And I really loved it. I, I was entranced. It was so good. And it was this new music. And I, and I hear what you're saying. It's like most people, it's the promise and then that's it. But yeah. he's making this great new music. Wang Chung making mm -hmm. great new music. Like these guys are still out there doing some great stuff. But where's the platform? It's people yeah. like you. So we really appreciate that. Oh, you're very welcome. So, Julian, we kind of mentioned earlier, um, I, I knew you before this album, uh, primarily just from Strange Love and the Electric Duke. But when I heard at the, when I heard uh, at the end of the line, I was really hooked and really wanted me to pick up the. I wanted to get this album. I got it when it was released, and I'll be honest, it's been on heavy rotation on my playlist mm -hmm. since then. I really want to get into some more deep dive into your into your back catalog, as I'm sure our listeners are going to want to do the same after they hear this album. How can our listeners find your music, or where's the best place to to find your music at? The best place for me is the Bandcamp. Because okay. obviously then, because all, I think all of my music is up for a pay what you want. Like if you want to download it for free, you can, if you want to pay me, because people, people are very generous. Like people mm. know what, what my context is. It's like, this is my living and I'm, I'm driven. I mean, I've got something like 12 albums up on this, on the band camp, but you can listen on Spotify too. I mean, I, there is a Spotify link and, and that's useless to us, except that, I mean, it's not useless because I, appreciate every fan that i can get i really do I, I anybody that i mean when i go to a strange love show and somebody comes up to me and says you know i really love your original material it's a massive thrill it, it, i can't tell you how thrilling that is because it, it's impossible to connect with an audience unless you're playing live all the time you know i'm talking with you is a thrill to me because you know you're listening to my stuff and you appreciate it <laughs> but um you know band camp's good there, there's Spotify, Apple Music, I'm on all the platforms. Um, I would start with Elysium because it's my favorite album at the moment, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> and I'm here to promote it. But 404 Not Found is a is a very, you know, coherent pop album. Emptiness Inside is the second album. That's the one for the goths, I think. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of really happy songs on there, but, but <laughs> the, there's also the darkest stuff. Like there's a song on there which people have described as sounding like the Beaulieu Brothers. Mm. It's just another Bowie reference. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, back to Elysium, have you been playing that new album live? I have. I was hoping to put a band together um, for the launch date. I have a band. I mean, obviously, I have a I have a six piece Bowie band who is fantastic and they will play with me if, if I need them to. There's been a lot of strange love shows and I have a little girl. So when we're not playing out with Strange Love, I tend to want to have my little girl with me. She's um, coming up to eight. And I, when I'm touring every weekend, I miss her very mm. much. So, yeah. you know, I, I, I have to make that hard choice at some point. I've, I've discussed it with the Strange Love entity that when I can put 200 people in the room guaranteed extra by playing original material that we will play in support of strange love because obviously we oh, play nice. you know a couple of thousand people a weekend so if i can get up and do an original set before strange love that would be a perfect scenario for me so we're working all the it. better yeah well you know i do think that when you have that chance to i i think that those songs are going to be received very well by an audience I, I did i did a whole bunch of live streams throughout the pandemic for the bowie covers and I did a few which were original material where I debuted Darkling Universe, which was end of 2020. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And I got a lot of very positive responses just from the live stream, just me and a guitar and, and the track. So I, I'm very confident. Certainly All Good Soldiers was a big hit. Mm. I, you know, I've, I've played live with, with a live band um, for a while. I actually, the last show I did with a live band was just when my daughter was born. Mm. Just before, it was CMJ 2014, CMJ in mm. New York. That was the last live show I've done as a, as a, oh no, wait a minute. I did a couple of shows with the drummer and the guitar player from the Bowie band. Mm. And they were sick. They were particular um, key shows, but this is in 2019, I want to say. And it was fantastic. Like the response was amazing. I mean, I had people, you know, never met before just spontaneously dancing, which is a great sign, like not huge mm. full shows, but people dancing, never having heard yeah. of them before. So yeah. I, I was very thrilled with that so I, I know it's going to work very well when i get it when i get it together and i've talked with david chatfield who's the guy that did the end of the line remix he's doing a whole series of press releases for me he's he's kind of at this point in some senses man in a management role although he's not officially my manager he's really helping with promotion and marketing and stuff like that so i promised him when we have something <laughs> you know, significant to do. And we have a, 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 there's a, there's a sort of tipping point where you just have to do live shows. Mm. And, I, and I have the guys in place who are excellent musicians and I know will be fabulous for it. I also have projections and it's, it's a big <laughs> show. It's, it's not, you know, it's not just a four guys on stage. It's, it's an, an experience. It would be an experience. And I, and yeah. I know which songs will work. Cause I have, I have a, a large catalog and I think Elysium has got, six songs that will translate very well live so well i i can say for steve and myself we hope that you'll make it to our area we'd love to see your show live i me too me too where are you <laughs> we're in salt we're, lake city you're in salt lake right of course. yeah so let's change let's change the subject here for the last in uh, last uh uh question of this interview um, we're gonna be beyond you playing multiple instruments we're gonna really have to call you a multi-hyphenate because uh, I understand that last year you did some acting, playing a vampire in Hollywood and vamp at the Bourbon Room in Hollywood. Is that something you've done a lot, or is this acting your next adventure? Um, I have acted in various things. I've, I've written a few bits and pieces for films, where I've always been in the film as a mm. you know, band member or some somebody. I've, I've been an extra, maybe fifty films when I was oh, living wow. in London. And TV shows, I've been, you know, I was acting in BBC TV, crime-like shows and stuff like that. I didn't pursue it because obviously my time is very constrained by touring. Mm. But yeah, I would. I've I've written a television show, which is is based around my experiences in in music. And I'm pitching at the moment. Uh, It has a lot of, a lot of my music in it, obviously. And I've written a role in it for me to play. Nice. So if if that comes to fruition, which I'm hoping it will at least by the end of next year, then I'll probably do that, you know, do shoot all my scenes in a week and mm. then can go in, you know, pepper it through the show. <laughs> <laughs> well, Julian, we can't thank you enough for uh, joining us today on the podcast. You mentioned Bandcamp. Uh, you know, we actually, one of our listeners had heard a little bit of your music and he went on Bandcamp and purchased the new album and he really enjoyed it. And uh, so, yeah, I would definitely recommend anybody listening to this interview. Uh, if you like some of the songs that you've heard on there, go on to Bandcamp, purchase the album. It's well worth it. Uh, but again, we want to thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, We will uh, put links in the bio of this episode so that we can make sure that people can access that. And again, it has been a pleasure talking to you. You too. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm, I'm thrilled. I will share this far and wide so people can listen. Fantastic. Well, we appreciate it. Steve, anything left? No, just like you said, Elysium is a really fantastic album. It's probably going to end up in my top 10, if not my top five of the year, I'd really recommend it to any of our listeners that like uh, the new wave music. It's going to be a fantastic album for you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thanks, Julian.